All right. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Gary Hogan. I work over the Environment Health and Safety here at Oklahoma State University. Uh, if you ever need our services for any reason, anything deals with occupational safety within the workplace, fire, uh, hazardous waste, um, EPA portion of the ocean side of it, uh, come over to the University Health Services Center and come to the basement. Um, and that's where we're located at now. So um, just want to kind of clarify that because we've had some people that know we've moved. We've been moved for about yeah, a little, almost to a year right now. So that's where we're located at. Each stress falls under the two, two categories. Falls under the general industry standard, deals with OSHA, and also part of that falls in the construction aspect. So during this time, we're going to cover heat stroke, heat, heat exhaustion, heat cramps, um, and also cover heat rash, and I'll get into sun safety. And I've got two short video segments to cover on the sun portion of it. So as we go through, if you have anything you want to add, please do so. Uh, or anything you'd like to have additional information to pass on the others. Uh, that's what it's here all about. How many have ever heard of a heat stroke before? Is it deadly? It can be. It can be very bad for a person. Remember this, heat stroke involves a couple things. Number one, your body gets to the point where it cannot release the heat away from the body itself. Okay. 106, 105 body temperature or higher, very little sweating, if any sweating at all. It does not matter if you're young or if you're old folks, you can still have a stroke, heat stroke at any time. And that's something a lot of people do not give too much thought about until they either experience one or they have a family member that actually has one. So kind of be cautious out there. I'm going to show you some of the basic symptoms coming up next with the heat stroke. Dry hot skin. Now a telltale sign there, it may be kind of a reddish looking color of the skin. Go to the next part up here, it may have hallucinations. Uh, the chills and the throbbing headaches is another good example. Okay, How can you tell if someone's chilling out there? Any ideas? What would you look for if someone says, I think I might be having a heat stroke, I've got high body temperature, I'm kind of shivering, chilling just a little bit. There's something you can look at on the body that may actually tell if they're chilling or not. And I know you all have done this before. Goosebumps. Yeah, someone said it right there. Look at the arms. A lot of times they have little goosebumps on the arm or maybe the hair may be raised it just a little bit. And that's kind of a good indicator, hey, they may be chilling at that particular time. Let's go to the next part up here. Uh, high body temperature, confusion or even slurred speech. That's another basic symptom to look for if you have a person who's having a heat stroke. You've got to get that body cooled down, folks, and that's the simplest way to remember it. One of the things you want to keep in mind when you start cooling the human body down, there's a couple ways you can do it. Number one, you can either get you some really um, cold rags, get some ice, put it in a plastic bag, start underneath the armpit area, the back of the neck. Worst comes to worst, you put uh, ice packs in the groin area. You may not want it so important to remember those areas. You hit it, sir. Perfect. That's where your main blood flows, right? Basically from the waist to the top of the head. That's what you really focus in on during that time when you're trying to cool the body down. If you cool it down too quickly, what will happen to them? Yeah. They're going to shock. And that's what you have to be very, very cautious of right there. So one way you can actually prevent that from occurring is to make sure they keep hydrated, which is very, very critical. If you do have any uh, wet rags, if you have access to a fan, that's another way you can actually cool the body down. Remember, you've got to get that heat pulled away from the body somehow. And once you get it pulled away, the body temperature will start to lower within that time frame. Okay, but remember, if you lower it too fast, they can really go in with another shelf. So kind of be careful. Um, call number one, of course. Um, the other thing, too, is you can always soak the clothes, uh, take wet rags, something like that. You can put underneath the clothing or across the chest area. Um, even in the arms there. If that's all you have, it's better than nothing or put them into a cool movement to a cool building of some type. You have to be outside, find some type of shade tree, somewhere you can put them in order to start fanning them and get their body cooled down as quickly as you possibly can in the same manner. Let's go to the next one up here. Heat exhaustion. This is one I know y'all been through. At least ever want to go at least one time in your life has probably experienced heat exhaustion. And what a heat exhaustion comes down to is it's a loss of fluids, 
when you're working, you start to sweat. Is that good or bad for the body, you think? It's good. Because when you sweat, it makes your body say, hey, I'm getting hot, so I'm going to sweat, I'm going to start cooling myself back down. But also while you're sweating, what are two things that you normally will lose? It's very important for the human body. Water and salt are none of the two things that you will lose if you ever go into heat exhaustion. Okay? Very, very critical to remember that. Heavy sweating, uh, extreme fatigue, for example, maybe dizziness, maybe lightheadedness, for example. Let's go to the other part up there. Maybe pale, flushed, or you may get to the point where their skin may be kind of an ashen, ashen looking color. Okay, as far as their complexion is concerned. They also may start having muscle cramps, which are very, very painful if you've never been through that portion of it. The next part is you want to kind of look at slightly elevated body tension, fast treatment, shallow breathing. Heat exhaustion, remember this, hydration, hydration, hydration. Okay, you've got to get that liquid put back into the body somehow. Preferably put it into the liquid form. It's a lot easier for you to have them sip water in order for the fluids to get directly into the body. How many glasses of water should you drink a day, you think? Can you all ever think too much about that? And I know some of you all in this group work in very, very hot environments in the type of job that you all do. Any ideas? Four, five, maybe ounces. Okay. Probably about eight, eight ounces of glasses. Of <coughs> eight, eight ounces of glass of water per day. That's quite a bit if you think about it. And that's just for the average person that's out there. So as I say, if you're going to be outside on top of the roof working, or even outside, you may want to increase that from eight glasses maybe to twelve or ten. You know, it all depends on what your level of activity is during that time frame. But if you lose the fluid, you've got to replace the fluid. You can live without food, but it's hard to live without water uh, for any given period of time. So remember, hydration, hydration is very important. The other thing, too, is basic first aid as far as heat exhaustion is concerned. Get them into a cool environment. Start cooling their body down. Have them sip the water instead of drinking it very quickly. Have them sip it because uh, it will stay down into the body. If they drink it too quickly, they're going to throw all that water back up. That's what you don't want to do. Make sure you stay away from diuretic type beverages. Drink some things that they'll actually pull water away from the body. Uh, alcohol is a prime example. You've heard that, I'm sure, over and over before. It is a dehydrator. What about any type of, uh, of iced tea? Is that a diuretic, you think? Yeah, it's very, most people don't realize that. Drink iced tea, within just a little bit, 15, 20 minutes later, you need to run the restroom. You come back and wait, you keep drinking more iced tea. It tastes good. What you may not realize is you're not keeping that fluid intake up. It's going in and going right through your whole system. So uh, kind of make sure that you keep hydrated. Let's go to the other part up here. You may have to cool the person down once again as far as basic first aid is concerned. Move into an area with some shade, some coolness. Any type of airflow is better than none. Put a fan out there for them. Something they can stand in front of you. You can actually fan that person if you have to. Uh, towel, rag, anything you can come up with. you got to get creative when you start trying to cool the person's body down. Particularly if you have to be outside. And that's normally where you see a lot of this incidents to occur. Um, it's out in the open, people working. Next thing you know, your partner you're working with drops completely down. That's what you don't want to have to see out there. So remember, make sure you keep hydrated. Here's a good example right here. If you do have the person to lie down, do not give them beverages if they're laying flat on the back. You may want to have them sit up just a little bit. Have them sip the drinks. Raise the feet up just a little bit. Okay? Don't raise the feet if you suspect a spinal and neck or even a back injury. But if you don't suspect anything like that, elevate the feet. And the whole idea behind that is getting the blood from the feet to the heart, from the heart back to the brain. That's what you're trying to accomplish there. Uh, wet towels, wet rags. As you see in the picture right there, underneath the armpit area, across the chest region, um, get a fan flowing across there as well. Everything we've talked about is cheap. Don't cost you any money so far, which is something most people don't realize. You have to have elaborate equipment. Just remember, use common sense as far as cooling them down. Heat cramps is something you all may have experienced before. One of the things you want to keep in mind, heat cramps, it's a loss of fluid out of your large muscles, your abdomen, your thighs, your calf muscles. Um, in the thigh region, a lot of times you may experience cramps in those particular locations. What's the easiest way to get rid of heat cramps? Anybody know? That's one. What else? And I know y'all, some of y'all have this in the area y'all work in. 
And maybe I'll like to drink pickle juice. <laughs> you like it, do you? It's not too bad. It's not too bad, is it? Nope. The good thing about it is, it is something that works very quickly, it works very thoroughly because it's full of salt. It's also full of potassium, which works out pretty good with pickle juice. I may not like the taste of it, but I guarantee you it will stop in about five to ten minutes if you ever had heat cramps before. Usually it occurs after you work hard all day, you not get yourself hydrated, you go in, you relax, your muscles start basically constricting. Uh, if you've never been through that, basically feel like someone takes that muscle and just squeezes as hard as they possibly can. Uh, you'll take anything to get rid of the pain if you've ever been through that. So uh, do kind of remember that, please. Let's go to the other one up here. We cover the symptoms. Cover the basic first aid. Most of the food that you eat nowadays has plenty of salt in it or plenty of sodium. Uh, just look at a, um, a uh, soft drink, for example. Even on soft drinks, they have sodium in it. Look at the back of the label and read those. The food that you eat, it comes in a can, more likely has sodium in it. Uh, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. Normally you get to add so salt to those top products, but if it's in a can, normally those already have salt added into it. So, and you know, used to it's one of the people took a lot of them, salt tablets, because a lot of food you had years ago did not have salt already in it. So that's something else to kind of always keep in mind. Uh, after, you've, after you've had heat cramps, of course, uh, kind of limit activity for a couple of hours before you actually go back and do any type of strenuous work, um, if all possible. If you ever had these before, I guarantee you, you'll never forget them, because uh, they do hurt. Heat rash is something else that you may experience out there. And heat rash is one of the things that most people neglect to even think about. They say, well, how does this affect me? There's like a bunch of little needles being poked through your skin, that's what it feels like. Maybe blisters, even small little pimples. Uh, that's what it kind of looks like, a massive of those. Usually involves the area of the body where the skin folds, okay? In your arm, where your arm bends, behind your knee area. Uh, underneath your armpit area, the breast area, the groin area, or if you have to be wearing a full body harness, like so many guys that make maintenance of those, just anything rubbing against the skin actually causes a heat rash to occur. The one that most people forget all about is the top of their foot or their feet. If you have socks on, you put a pair of boots on, some people don't take them off when they get on the evenings. Your feet start to, start to sweat, and guess what? There's nowhere for that moisture to go to. So remember, wash that area, dry that area, let some air flow in that particular area. If you happen to use talc powder, uh, it works very effectively. Or if you're allergic to talc powder, use cornstarch. It works the same exact way. So this is something I thought I'd throw in there. If you've never been through this, I guarantee you it hurts. Uh, feels like a bunch of little needles being poked into the human body. So kind of be careful, please. Try to work your cool in those humid areas, of course, as much as you possibly can. The higher the humidity, folks, the more sticky the skin, the more sticky the skin, the more likely there's going to be some type of rash in that particular area. So, uh, just something that you may want to remember there. This is for the employers, okay? Some recommendations, if you know you're going to have employees, go out and do a job. If it's going to be done out in an open area, you know it's going to be hot. If at all possible, have them do it early in the morning. As it starts to heat up throughout the day, they can start moving into shaded areas. But typically, if you have a job, you work outside a lot. Um, the other thing, too, that you do want to uh, keep in mind as well, if you come up here to uh, number three right here, it does take you a while for you to become acclimated working out in the heat. Uh, or if you work in a cooled area, you ain't getting that. You guys should go outside for a period of time. Your body goes through several adjustments trying to adapt to those type of environmental conditions. Typically, you're talking about hot weather, stickiness, humidity, and things like that. A good example of that, how many of y'all remember the school you went to school at? Uh, did it have air conditioning or non air conditioning? How many of y'all had an air conditioned school? Yeah, how many of y'all went to one that had no air conditioning yet? What was it like? Do you remember? It was hot. It was hot. You learned to dress for the occasion, but most importantly, you we were very adapted to basically working in a hot environment. And what happens a lot of times, people work in an air conditioned facility, they go home on the weekends and try to do work outside, and they become overheated, and next thing you know, they want to have a heat stroke, 
eat exhaustion, eat cramps. And every one of these are preventable, it's out there. So you kind of keep that in mind. Have to get acclimated to the um, heat itself. Micro breaks, as far as water breaks are concerned, okay? Don't wait till you're thirsty. In our 15, 20 minutes, take you a drink of water. Sip the water. You got a water fountain. You got all kinds of things you can get water in, put water in. It doesn't have to be the bottle of water, but a little tap water works just the same way. But you have got to keep that body hydrated. Okay? Let's go to the next part up here. Monitor the work that you're working with. Watch the person sitting directly beside you if you happen to be out there working. They can go, go completely down. You may not know something wrong with them. That's the scary part of it right there. They may show some of the basic symptoms and you really aren't paying that much attention to them and they have no idea what's going on during that time frame. So kind of keep track of the employees you work with. How is the heat affecting them at that particular time? This is for the workers. We're loose type clothing, light colored clothing, breathable type clothing. Try to stay away from your blended type of materials. Your nylons, your polyester blend type materials. They do not allow heat, uh, air to flow through those type of materials. Same way with your Under Armour shirts. If you don't wear those, you may not realize they have a summer and also have a winter shirt that doesn't label like it. The summer one allows air to actually go through and cool the person's body off. The winter one actually holds it in. Something else you want to kind of keep in mind as far as the employee, make sure you keep hydrated. It's up to you to keep yourself hydrated throughout the day. No one's going to walk around and say, hey, make sure you drink enough water. It's not going to happen that way. One other thing, too, is you do want to always keep in mind, gradually build up the heavy work and fall possible. I know a lot of people don't give too much thought about that, so let's get everything done right now. The next thing you know, they're over there passed out or having heat-related illnesses. And that's what you don't want to have an employee go through. Let's go to the next part up here. Stay away from any type of alcoholic beverages, caffeine, or green time sugar. Okay, drink water, it works pretty good. There's also something else that's gonna work that you may want to kind of think about if you haven't taken any type of diuretics. Some of y'all may take diuretics. Some people call them water pills. And what those are designed to do is eliminate water or fluid that's within the human body. It also tells you there, make sure you keep your water intake up or your fluid intake up as well. Uh, we've had several come through these classes already this morning. And this morning actually said they had experienced this before. Take those type of medications, they don't think too much about the food intake until they actually get sick out there. So I did want to mention that. Let's go to the next part up here. This is an app. Some of the early groups logged into the apps directly off Google, go to ocean.gov, and uh, they've actually got this little uh, app put together. Looks just like this right here. Basically, it talks about the area that you're in, talks about the temperature. It also covers the humidity in that particular area. It also gives you the exact heat that's coming off the surface at that time. Have it on mine. Well, I tried this weekend. It's pretty accurate. I was actually working out on concrete and had it right there in front of me. It was just, I mean, just going crazy, but it did work like it was supposed to. So if you get a chance, you may want to download that app. It does work. There's several others that are out there. But this is just some kind of an overview of things we want to cover deals with heat related type illnesses in the workplace. So things to kind of think about. Um, I know some of y'all may work in an area that's very hot, humid, sticky type of feeling. Remember, keep your fluid intake up. Even in the winter time, you can actually become dehydrated. A lot of people say, well, it's just when it's, it's hot outside, we're worried about that. No, continuously. The fluid and take up. I cannot stress that enough after how important water is to the human body. Also acts as a good lubricant for the joints um, as well, water does. So, uh, you'll have any questions over heat stress? Cover all the four different types that you may run across out there. All right, we'll start with the hand out there in front of you. This is one that came from the CDC or the Center for Disease Control. Probably one of the simplest ones I've ever ran across out there. I've seen quite a few of these before. One of the things you want to keep in mind is please make sure you remember this. If you see any changes to your body, remember your ABCs. You'll see that coming up here in the video in just a little bit. The 
Tip if you have any trouble as far as skin cancers are concerned. I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, the video presentation is not very long. I think it's like maybe three or four minutes long, the whole part process is. Uh, I'm going to let you watch that. And right now we're going to Sunsafe. Uh, and it's directly from the FDA. It's brand new information that you have to put out. One of the things I want y'all to keep in mind, if any of y'all having the spray sunscreen that you can buy out there, any of y'all <coughs> have that? I used to sell them oh, about three weeks ago. It worked pretty good, actually. It works pretty good. Just remember this. Keep it out of direct, away from the sun and heat sources. Folks, that can will explode on you. I know. It will blow up. It's in a compressed cylinder. I did want to mention that because most people don't realize it. Something in a compressed cylinder, you get it hot, it will explode. Just because it's got sunscreen in it, it will do the exact same thing. So kind of watch out for that. Let's see. Where did it disappear? to be that the only labeling you got was the sun protection factor or SPF and this is still an important number the FDA recommends an SPF of 15 or higher but numbers can be deceiving an SPF over 50 does not I repeat does not equal better sunburn protection so that's all good but the FDA knows we can do better you'll also want to look for broad <coughs> From on the label. That means that all of the harmful rays in the spectrum are blocked. See, the sun produces two types of radiation that sneak through the ozone onto us. Ultraviolet A rays age the skin like the skin of this apple. Ultraviolet B rays burn the skin and both kinds cause the big C, cancer. You're only fully protected if your sunscreen says broad spectrum on the label. The FDA has banned the terms waterproof and sweatproof because those terms are as fanciful as unicorns. Mix water and sunscreen and the sunscreen loses power, period. The updated sunscreen labels will tell you exactly how long the sunscreen is water resistant, so how often to reapply. So you've got the new labels, bought the perfect sunscreen, but none of that counts if you use it wrong. Should you wear sunscreen on a cloudy day? Yes, 80% of ultraviolet rays still get through the haze. Those UV rays, the ones that create age spots and wrinkles, go right through glass. So, should you even wear sunscreen in the car? Absolutely. So what is the perfect amount to use? No, not enough. Whoa. It takes one ounce or approximately a shot glass full of sunscreen to cover an average adult from head to toe. Then you have to reapply every two hours even if you stay dry. Sure, the paler your skin, the more you risk a sunburn. But ultraviolet rays can cause irreversible damage to all skin tones. So look for updated FDA approved labels. SPF plus broad spectrum equals healthy, happy, fun in the sun. Okay, one thing they, they did not mention in that area is kind of important. You do wear the sunscreen, make sure it is reapplied. 
Um, don't forget about the lip area. That's something a lot of people don't give too much thought about. And they put all over the face, their nose, ears, and all that. Forget about the sunscreen as far as actually protecting the lips. Uh, but it's a very susceptible area that skin cancer is located in that particular area. One coming up next talks directly about melanoma. Uh, actually, you're going to see uh, three different ones that they're going to show you. There's nothing bad about it. It's it's not the, the disgusting video. It's a very good video they've actually come up with. It's very um, straightforward what they're actually asking. So, let's see if I can find it on here real quick. <coughs> For Sonia Perry, worrying about skin cancer was low on her list of priorities. I always uh, related that to um, uh, um, Caucasians. So I had no idea. I, had, I took no precautions as a, as a child growing up, uh, and even as a young adult, uh, to protect myself from the sun. And that didn't change, even when she found an odd spot under her nail about eight years ago. A biopsy showed that it was simply an abnormality that should be monitored. But about a year ago, she noticed something was different. I noticed that the area that was dark started to spread, it started getting darker further and further out towards the end of the finger. And so I went to my regular dermatologist and asked him if he would take a look at it. And when he looked at it, he said, now who told you this was not melanoma? What had just been an abnormality was now determined to be skin cancer and in Sonia's case, melanoma. More than three million cases of skin cancer are diagnosed in the U.S. each year, making it the most common type of cancer. There are three major types of skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. The first two types are almost 100% related to sun and UV exposure. Skin cancer is uh, a cell on your skin that's growing and dividing out of control and not doing what it's supposed to do. So we worry about skin cancer because those cells can not only grow abnormally in the skin, but they can leave the skin and grow in other places, like the lungs, liver, somewhere else. And that's why people can actually die from skin cancer, especially melanoma, which is the most deadly form of skin cancer. Melanoma forms in the cells that make pigment called melanin, which gives skin its color and may protect it from damage from ultraviolet rays, which is why people with darker skin are less likely to get skin cancer than those with lighter complexions. However, melanoma can form in anyone. Typically, it's found in nail beds or the soles of the foot, but it can be found on the skin. 
eyes, mouth, or intestines, and it's especially dangerous for the African-American population. Though it's less common, it does tend to be more deadly in that population. In the sense, if you look at survival for melanoma in African-Americans, it's, it's much lower than it is in the Caucasian population. Um, and they do tend to present with more advanced disease than Caucasian patients. Early detection makes most of the sun-related skin cancers highly treatable. There's a variety of treatments for both basal cell and squamous cell cancers. Um, some of the more superficial ones can be treated topically with different ointments or creams. Larger ones need to be excised, um, most of which can be done by a dermatologist themselves. With melanoma, the treatment is more intense. In Sonia's case, she had the tip of her finger amputated and is regularly monitored to make sure the cancer has not spread. Radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or immunotherapy may be recommended in addition to surgery. While staying out of the sun and using sunblock is important in prevention, doctors also advise patients to closely monitor any changes to their skin. Typically, we talk about the ABCDs of melanoma, so a mole that's asymmetric, a mole that has irregular borders, a mole that's varying in color, and a large mole, so increasing in diameter. Um, people talk about E as well, which is an evolving mole, so something that's changing over time. So that can be recognized by the patient themselves or, or by their dermatologist. Sonia, who is currently cancer-free, is making it her mission to spread the word to everyone about the dangers of skin cancer. I think there are a lot of people out there who thought, it, it can't happen to me. It, you know, not melanoma, maybe some other cancer, but not melanoma. But, you know, I, I just want everyone to understand that it's not so much sun-related, it's not because you're African-American or Caucasian, it is because it is a cancer that can affect anyone at any time. Holly for first CNN. Okay, one thing you can also consider as well, um, I know some of y'all may take some antibiotics. Uh, some of those antibiotics may actually have a, a little label on it that says avoid direct sense sun exposure. Uh, do take that to note, please, because it actually causes you to burn worse. I know a lot of people who see stuff like that and they don't really pay that much attention to it until they actually get put in that kind of situation. So, uh, light color clothing, cover up as much as you possibly can with that. Not only that, but you also keep cool at the same time. Um, lighter color, long sleeve shirts, hats, um, some type of eye protection to keep UV rays from coming directly into the eye itself. So far, everything we've covered is a matter of taking the time to put it on or go get yourself checked out. And so if you happen to think you have a dermatologist, they can determine if you have problems every day. This stuff does not happen at the, the very beginning. This is kind of like long term exposure. Uh, usually, when you start getting up in the 30s, 40s, and before that time, you may start seeing some spots changing your body. Only you uh, can actually go down and have someone check you out. So, it's up to you to make that decision. Did this class last year for a group, and one of the guys called me a couple weeks later and said, hey, I went to a dermatologist, and I explained, I found out I had melanoma, he said. I uh, had no earthly idea. And um, when he went to his annual check, that's one of the things that he didn't mention, uh, some of the stuff, stuff that he'd seen in the video. And I uh, found out, I was actually on the top of his head, uh, to the very back portion of it, he wasn't able to see back there. And uh, that's where they did find it. So, um, I guarantee you go up to this place now here on campus and he's all covered up from head to toe. Um, this is basically comes down to that. So, like I said, it is preventable. It's not right. taking the time to take care of yourself while you're out Do you have anything you want to add? Take it with you, please. You can share it with your family members. Um, that's a lot of good information on there. And uh, protect yourself as much as you possibly can out there. Light layers of clothing. Be careful during the summer. Y'all take care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah.